Hi, I'm Evan Jones with Google Cloud, and I'm really excited to have Joy with us here. She is a data educator and supervisor at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Welcome to the show, Joy. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's really exciting. A lot of things are happening virtually these days, and interviews are just one of them. But thankfully, we both have really good internet connections, and we've got a treasure trove of questions to ask you, particularly about certification and your background. Do you mind if we just jump in? Yeah, fantastic. Let's go. All right. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and what brought you to this certification and how it's related to your work, if you don't mind. Sure. So as you stated, I work for the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and we are a customer of Google Cloud Platform as well as other uh, cloud providers. And two years ago, I was sent to Google Cloud Next, which was a great opportunity, and I really enjoyed it. And as part of the lead up to the conference, I received an email inviting me to consider applying for this diversity cohort that was intended to help broaden the appeal and broaden the class of people who were certified um, as Google Cloud experts. Uh, and that was something that really appealed to me. And it appealed to me because, um, number one, for my own professional growth and education, I thought that would be very useful for me. Absolutely. And yeah, as well as the fact that I am a data educator. And it's really important to me to multiply everything that I'm able to do and teach others and deputize them in turn to train still others. So it just seemed like it was a real opportunity to, in my local community at CHOP, uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and beyond, to really grow some education around cloud computing. What would you say to those folks who hear the word examination or certificate and they might not have a strong background in data or have the technical skills, but they look at you and they say, you know, she can do it, I can do it, let's go do this thing. I'm going to sign up. I'm going to be the next, uh, the, that next cohort that, that's coming out, Joy. What would you say to those people who have a little bit of, at Google we call it imposter syndrome, which is mm. you walk into a room and you feel like everyone else in the room is, is you know, smarter than you, has done all this, and they deserve to be here, and you, and you might not, you feel like you don't be, belong there, even though absolutely with, with everything of, of their core being, they, they need to be there, and they, and they should be there. How would you motivate those people that are going to be joining that next cohort after you? What would you say to them? Well, I have two sound bites. Um, uh, one is don't believe everything you think. So, um, I like that one. So just because you think uh, this is beyond your skills or – you know, you're, you're too far behind because you're over 50 or you never worked with computers or, or whatever the reason is. Um, don't, don't believe everything you think. And also, if you're the smartest person in the room, you are in the wrong room. I love you that need, one. You need to be uh, with people that are smarter than you and know more than you. Uh, and start being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, I think that's something in this current, this is being filmed during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, and a lot of us are getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, and that's a real life lesson. So I will say that imposter syndrome, I don't think ever really goes away, but uh, I have learned to talk back to it. And one of the things that I, I find, because I've taught technology to children and adults, and one of the things that I've noticed is the emergence of the confidence gap. And in my experience, this happens around fifth or sixth grade, where uh, some people, uh, predominantly boys, although not exclusively, uh, feel very confident in math and science. And when they run across challenges, like a really hard math problem, so math starts getting really hard around sixth, seventh grade, right? Uh, when they run across a hard math problem, they think to themselves, wow, this is a hard problem. I'm super smart for tackling this hard problem. And then there's a group uh, of students, predominantly but not exclusively girls, who uh, maybe because they've done well in school up to this point without as much effort, um, realize that, wow, this is much more effort than I'm accustomed to. I must not be up to the task. And, and that confidence gap I still continue to see in people, and it's interesting to me because I work with very, very smart people. I work with people who are MD, PhDs. I work with students who are in grad school at Yeshiva who are adult learners who have important full-time jobs. I work with very smart people, and they have imposter syndrome, and they feel like, wow, this is hard, and 
I wrote some code and it failed. And what they don't realize, because they're not in this industry, is in tech, you fail all the time. You fail and you fail and you fail and you finally succeed, but you don't get to rest in it and roll around and how wonderful it is because you've got to go on to the next thing and start failing again. And that's not like most jobs. So I do a lot of soft skills and helping people get comfortable with failure and get comfortable with not being great at things. You're not going to be great at this when you start. And that's fine. You're not supposed to be great. So hang in there. You're going to be fine. Don't panic when you make a mistake. And uh, don't believe everything you think. I think that's, that's perfect, Joy. I love the... Uh get comfortable being uncomfortable. Even to this day, I mean, a lot of people look at the folks who work at Google and, oh, you know, you've got a job at Google. That's like, you know, everyone there is, you know, genius and writing the next self-driving car application or something like that. I, can, I can't tell you, you know, I can, I can tell you every day there's a moment where I'm like, you're running into that, that same type of wall, that same type of wall where you're in fifth grade or sixth grade and you're up against a math problem or a technical problem or an interpersonal problem and you feel, you feel that a little bit of that uncomfortability. And I, I, could, I couldn't plus one or agree with your point more of it's the step that you take next. It's either you're going to run away from that or you're going to say, it's all right to feel uncomfortable, but I'm still going to do this anyways. I think that that's a perfect message out there. All right, uh, this the certification, I would love to ask you a few more questions on that if you don't mind. How, sure. how has the certification uh, itself uh, either impacted the, the organization you work for or the communities that you're, you're a part of? Sure. I mean, especially as an adjunct professor, it's very important to me that the education that I'm giving my students is the most cutting edge mm -hmm. because it might take them two, three, four years. These are adult learners who are very busy to finish their master's degree which means that by the time they leave, what I taught them their first year is already a couple of days, a couple of years out of date, right? So I wanna make sure that at the, the day I deliver that lecture or share that collab notebook, uh, that it is the most up-to-date I can possibly do. Um, and so I do a lot of advocating with uh, senior folks at my uh, educational institution at Yeshiva University for adopting cloud platforms and saying, this is where our students are going to be working. So, it, you know, it's sure, they should certainly install Python on their uh, laptops, absolutely. You know, if you want to have, you know, a SQL server spun up someplace, um, you know, on campus, that's great too. But realistically, as far as job skills, our students are going to be working in the cloud. So how can we really leverage my skills and whatever topic I'm teaching, uh, whether that's learning to program in Python or doing computer vision or, um, you know, some sort of data engineering or data pipelines. Uh, no matter what sort of topic I'm teaching, there's a way to tie it to cloud in a way that really is building students' abilities to understand the vocabulary, to be able to be autodidacts, right, to have the terminology to, to know the concepts well enough to know what to search for. You know, I, uh, I always say that so much of what I teach is telling people what to Google and how, Absolutely. To, Google how to Google, right? Uh, you know, my, uh, and, I, and I also tell people, you know what, I Google this every day too. So if you think that I have the syntax memorized, I do not. Uh, and... <laughs> People always get surprised. So I, I do a lot of uh, uh, BigQuery and SQL courses, and they always get surprised when I'm presenting in a classroom and I'm going to Google to, to look up like some of these functions. They're like, "Wait a minute! You know, you presented on you know an online platform this with ease," and I'm like, "I don't memorize this stuff, but I know where to look." Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Yeah. So I mean, that's that's my life as an adjunct professor. I I would also say, I've had people come to me at at work or just in the community and say hey, I saw on LinkedIn that you are Google Cloud certified. I want to find out more about this. And these are often career changers or people who discovered to their surprise that they really liked uh, DevOps or platform engineering uh, or uh, some, some of the background engineering. And maybe that wasn't the job that they were hired for, but they realized that, wow, you know, I have some technical skills and abilities that I didn't know about. Uh, and in fact, I had a conversation with someone um, who has a lot of information science experience, uh, but is not a programmer. She would not consider herself a programmer. And she said, can I pursue this? I said, absolutely. 
right? You know, there are, there are specialty professional grade exams for applications developers, but, you know, this initial uh, associate level uh, exam is just a great overview of lots of different things. And I said, if nothing else, what it will do is give you a chance to learn a lot, figure out what parts you like and what parts you don't. Um, for example, I am so grateful that there are network engineers. I thank my lucky stars for them every day because I could not do their job, right? Um, I feel that I feel the same way. Any any questions that I ever get on like IP addresses and routing like private network traffic, I'm like, ooh. <laughs> I mean, I look up how do you write a CIDR block notation, you know, probably every time, like, every like time, at least once a quarter, you know, sometimes it'll stick around for a little while. So one of the things, you know, I have I've had a, a very uh, circuitous career path. And along the way, I took 10 years out of 10 years out of technology to do full time volunteer work. And so I worked in uh, prisons and schools and homeless shelters in Spain and Bolivia and El Salvador. And one of the things that I really fell in love with was the power of education uh, to change people's lives at, at every level. Right? I worked with women um, who uh, spoke only their indigenous language, did not speak Spanish, maybe they only spoke Quechua or Aymara um, in Bolivia, and, and realizing that just their inability to speak Spanish kept them out of the marketplace. Uh, it kept them uh, impoverished. It kept them under the control sometimes of domestic abusers. And all the way up to people that I saw in prison who were getting degrees and making their lives better. And so I really, you know, I've, I've come back to full-time work um, because I love technology and I love education and I'm lucky enough to combine the two. And uh, at the end of the day, what I would love to do is go back into some of these uh, lower resourced areas and say, hey, NGOs, I would like to help you boost your signal. Let's take a look at your data. How can you be in charge of your data story? How can I help you? Um, there are resources that I can connect you with. And not only can I help you in GEO, but can I, can I also help the community you serve? What's the population you serve? What are they like? Because the wonderful thing about technology is it's not the formal degrees you have, it's what you can do. And this is one of the few industries I feel like that that is that continues to be true for. And knowing that I have the skills in Google Cloud Platform to help other people at all levels, including people with very low literacy, computer literacy, that they can access this stuff through a URL. They need a strong internet connection, which is not nothing, that can be challenging, but with just a strong internet connection and a Chromebook or a low powered laptop, I can really help someone grow in skills that will help them make a living, help them provide for their families, and also improve uh, the lot of, of organizations in under-resourced areas that are doing really important good things. Uh, so that's, 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 that's so well dream. said. I, I love that dream and, it, and it's the dream of uh, Google as a whole, their core mission is to make the world's information universally accessible to, to anyone and everyone. You know, not just people in the United States, not just people of a certain class or a certain privilege as well. So it just, it, it reminds me when you sp speak like the Chromebook and a URL and the internet and they access one of your IPython notebooks and they're doing a machine learning model that would have previously taken an entire Google data center to do like 10 years ago. Now they're running on their laptop in a cafe or something like that too. It's just, a, it's being able to access that technology and to your point, being able to access the educational resources and those badges like the certifications as well is just such a powerful story, Joy. Thank, thank you so much for sharing not only your background, but just the clear passion. I thought I'm a passionate person. I, listening to you just gets me motivated to take even more of these certifications as well. I certainly don't have them all. Uh, so thank you so much, so, so much. Any closing words from your side to inspire these the watchers? Oh, gosh. Um... <laughs> Let me I think. put you on the spot. I know. You did. Sorry. Let me think. <laughs> I'm usually pretty quick on my feet too. 
<laughs> no, um, wait, I'll, I'll I'll say mine and then and then uh, and then we can we can close with yours. So mine at, at Google we have a moniker, and this is from different than other companies that I work with. Is good artist copy, but great artists steal. So one of my favorite things that you mentioned is these collaborative notebooks for machine learning. A lot of our courses that I put out. I draw inspiration from a lot of the other works that are out there. The data science in particular is meant to be a community of folks kind of achieving a goal or an objective together. So don't feel like you need to go it alone, especially if you're looking at other people's resources as well. And certainly internally at Google, we're constantly stealing each other's uh, work and, and um, making the insights together as well. So, all right, it closes all with right. a, pithy, a pithy example for a quote, no so pressure. You know, so I come at this from a data scientist perspective. So other people may come to GCP from a lot of interest in um, high performance computing or, um, you know, uh, sort of network resilience or, or other issues or, or areas of interest. But I'm principally a data scientist. So I'm going to give you the answer of a data scientist. If you want to learn how to be a data scientist because you think this is interesting, then you definitely need to be involved with Google Cloud Platform because one of the best ways to learn data is using big data. And there is a great set of resources for you in Google Public Data Sets and BigQuery, uh, which is just a great place to get started. You can, uh, there's tons of tutorials that'll help you there that are available at no cost. The hosting of the data sets is at no cost. And all the work that you need to do can be done in free tier. So there are lots of ways that uh, even without participating in a formal training process or signing up for an exam, uh, that you can grow your skills and really find a data set that you're passionate about. I tell people, if you love sports, look at sports data. If you're concerned about hunger and poverty, look for those data sets. Find something you care about and you will definitely find some trends that make you scratch your head or make you angry. Uh, or make you excited or make you ask questions. So find some data, work with it, um, and change the world. I love, I love it. That's such a great way to close. All right, we have Joy with us from CHOP, which is the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Thank you so much for taking this time to talk a little bit about DEI and your entire background that's led you this far and carrying forward with you for your students and adult learners that you're taking forward as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time as well. This is great. Be well.